Welcome, everybody. I'm Jeff Schulman. I am a marketing professor at the University of Washington's Foster School of Business, and I'm excited to welcome everybody to another Foster the Product event where current and aspiring product managers get to come together to level up together, to learn, connect, and to develop. And so uh, Foster the Product is not just a chance to level up by hearing from uh, uh, an expert. And today we're all going to hear from one of the best to ever do it in terms of coaching and leading teams. Uh, but Foster the Product is also a chance to connect with each other, to meet students, uh, to meet potential mentors, and to just kind of connect practice with what's happening here at the University of Washington. We have uh, upcoming Foster the Product events. We have a special one on February 18th, where Jackie Bavaro is going to talk about cracking the PM career. And that's good, not just for students who wanna get into the PM career, but also if you've been in PM and you wanna see how to get to the next level, uh, Jackie Bavaro, who's written the book, Cracking the PM Interview and Cracking the PM Career, she's gonna be here on February 18th. And then the Chief Product Officer at Payscale will be presenting on OKRs and how to successfully implement them in your organization on March 4th. And so uh, Foster the Product is not just an event series, it's a community. It's open to everybody. So uh, bring your a, a colleague, bring a peer, uh, spread the word, because the bigger the community is, the more value everybody gets from it. Um, speaking of getting value from a community, I am so grateful that a community-minded leader is willing to share his valuable time with us here today. Uh, first, know Chris Peterson with that memorable Statue of Liberty play uh, that capped off Boise State's undefeated season and improbable victory over Oklahoma in the Fiesta Bowl uh, years ago. Uh, but Chris Peterson uh, took Boise State to two undefeated seasons, the BCS game victory there. Uh, he then came to the Huskies and uh, he did some wonderful work here where he won the Pac-12 several times, uh, took the, the Huskies to the um, uh, college football playoff and took them to the Rose Bowl. But uh, what I think, what I'm most excited about having Chris here today uh, present to the, on leading teams and aligning stakeholders towards a common vision is not just what his teams accomplished on the field, but what they accomplished off the field. Uh, so he implemented a built for life program here at UW that turned, uh, turned uh, athletes into adults and really helped groom them into just better human beings. And why is a football coach uh, here in a product community, well, uh, you might want to just build. That might be what you're excited about is building products. But building products takes a team. And uh, to get that team, you've got to, to lead that team, to motivate that team, and help build a product that's a win for your customers and a win for your business. And so I'm excited to learn. I hope all of you are excited to learn. Please give a warm welcome uh, to our guest speaker today, Chris Peterson. Mm. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, it's awesome to be here. I'm honored to be here. I've, I've had the opportunity to speak to a lot of groups in my day, but never a bunch of product managers. So I'm really hoping that I can give, you know, a couple things that help you guys in your journey along the way. And uh, that's that's my goal. That's my hope for today. And so we'll we'll get started here. I'll uh, I'll share my screen. And so I'm going to talk to you guys today about building a cultural playbook. And then I'm going to show you what we put together when I was the head coach at UW. And then uh, I'm gonna take you through why you need it, how you create it, and then what you do with it. And so what you're seeing here is this culture of excellence. And that's that was really the theme, the overarching theme of the work environment that we were trying to create in our football program. It's also what we named our culture. We thought it was really important to give our culture a name. And, um, you know, in college football, college athletics, we're governed by a pretty tight uh, group of rules by the NCAA. And so we're all kind of playing by the same, by the same rules. And so there's not a lot of flexibility of doing something different than somebody else is doing. And so we thought, hey, we're all kind of doing the same thing. Um, I guess we're just gonna have to do the same thing better than somebody else. So we adopted Booker T. Washington's definition of excellence was to do common things in uncommon ways. And we thought that really applied to us. And so I'll talk to you now about why you need this, why you need this. Um, in my 30 plus years of coaching and teaching, there's one thing that I've really learned that um, your team's level of performance will rise to the level of leadership you provide and the culture you build. I know this when, um, you know, when, when our teams were humming, 
when they were all good, when the leadership was, when our leadership unit did a great job getting everybody paddling the same direction, our performance was really good. It was a blast and we accomplished some really special things. And when we didn't do a good job and the culture went awry, we under we underachieved and it was painful at times. The second thing, the second reason why you need this is, is you're gonna have a culture one way or another. Like that's not an option. You're gonna have a culture. So you better create the environment that you want. And this environment needs to be an environment that's gonna stand up to hard things, to setbacks, to roadblocks, to adversity, because that's when we're all tested as a team and as a group. And so those days are coming. It's pretty easy to have a good culture when it's all good, right? That's not very difficult, but we know like in life and in business and in sports, it's seldom all good. So we need to figure out how to work together and play together. You know, one of the things that I have learned from sports and football in particular, that it's a game of random events and setbacks. And whoever handles that the best usually wins. And um, so I think, you know, th those are the things that hit me right away. I think the last thing is, if you're trying to put a special product out into the world or build a, put a team out there that's special, you first have to create a special environment. It doesn't work the other way around. You don't put something special out there, this team that goes and just gets it done or, or create this product and then the environment happens. It almost sounds ridiculous even talking about it like that. And so I've learned that, like you got to create the environment and then you have a shot to get something kind of special done. I will tell you this, I actually fell into the trap in 2005 when I first became the head coach at Boise State. I didn't want to sit down and put a cultural playbook together. I just wanted to teach, coach and compete. That's, all, that's what I've done my whole career. And now I'm in a new role. And so I left it alone. And about five months into the job, I could feel things start to slide in a big way. We just weren't operating as a team like we needed to. And so we got together and we sat down and we put a document and we put a, a plan together that when things got really good, which we believed they were going to, that we were going to do special things, that when that happened, we didn't, we didn't get full of ourselves and get off track. But we want to train tracks to keep us going right on what got us there. And likewise, on those hard days when it didn't go right and we're frustrated and we lost games or we lose a few games or we had a tough season, then we're not going to start grabbing straws and trying to figure things out. We know who we are. And so I think that's, that's really important. I'm going to move now into um, talking about what we did at the University of Washington. And so this is how we thought about it. You know, you got this, you got a team. And the team's made up anywhere from, you know, five to 10 to thousands of people, right? For us in our football program, we had about 115 to 20 players and maybe 60 to 70 support people around that that make this team go. When we thought about it, we first have a team. And within that team, we have different units, okay? And so for our, our, our players, we had 10 different units. We had our quarterbacks, our defensive backs, our offensive line, et cetera, 10 different units. But we also had a strength and conditioning department. We had a mar football marketing department. Um, we had a nutrition department. We had an operations department. So we had all these various units that fit in the team. And then lastly, we thought about ourselves. How do we fit into this puzzle? And so what we thought about there was that everybody owned 20 square feet of this team or this organization. And 20 square feet was just a metaphor we used to describe our area of responsibility. And then it was on us to own this 20 square feet. And nobody's responsibility was more important than somebody else's. The head coach was not more important than the defensive back or somebody in the marketing department. It was a mentality. For us to do great things, we have to own our area of responsibility and bring those gifts to the table, to our unit and to our team. And so this is kind of how we talk to our team about like, this is what it, this is what it looks like if we don't get this equation right. So the normal focus that a lot of times people think about, okay, when they're joining a team, they think about what does this have, what am I getting out of this? It's all about me. It's me first. 
And then I actually might think about my unit. Okay, how do you know, what am I going to get from my unit? How does that affect me? And then lastly, it's really about the organization, organization or the team. And so we thought that when you look at it like this, this big me, and then it's about my unit, and then it's about my team, that's about how it looks and feels. It's a mess. We want this mentality that I want to be part of something. I'm just a part of something bigger than myself. And so how do we get that done? We're wired to be selfish. I mean, it goes back thousands of years, right? And somehow we got to figure this team thing out and how we do this the right way. And so what we wanted to do was be able to flip the focus. And we wanted to think about team first. So when we show up to that building every day, it is about team. What can I do to make this organization better? What can I do to make my unit better? And then how do I just become a part of this and keep my ego in check and, and do this the right way? And so we look at it like this. It's team, it's unit, it's me. We're all about team, we're all about unit, we're all about me. And it's not to say that me is less important than the team or me is less important than my unit. We know that me is going to drive all these things, but it is a mentality that can I think about what can I do to help my team and my unit be the best that it can be. That paradigm shift changes everything. And we have to work about on this and talk about this. And so I'll tell you, I'll, I'll take you now to what we put together um, at Washington in our football program. So we're all about team, unit, me. So we believe in team. Well, that's a big word. I think it's the most overused, obnoxious word in the English language. Like everybody says, we're a team. You're not a team. You're a bunch of individuals working against each other half the time. We didn't want to be that. So what were we trying to get done? We were trying to get done where together we're better than separate. That we work together and we, you know, all of us together create this, you know, the whole's better than some of the parts. And, and really, if we could get good at this, we create this uncommon unity. So we really took team and then broke it down further. So they understood this. The most important thing is how do we behave as a big team or a big organization? Well, here's what some of the behaviors we came up with. We talk about crossbreeding all the time. We want to cross, get out of our clique, our circle, our, our tight group of friends that we have at work or on the team. And we, get to, we got to get to know each other. The seniors got to get to know the freshmen. The juniors got to go know the sophomores. And it's also about how we communicate with one another. It's not what you say, it's how you say it. Our team comes from all over the country with tremendously diverse backgrounds, all kinds of racial um, you know, diversity. So we had to be very accepting. Like that was one of the, we were gonna work on accepting each other for who we are, where we come from and getting to know each other would help that. And then lastly, we really need to work on caring for each other. And the best teams that I've been on, the best organizations, that care word turned into love. I don't start using that because we got to earn that and develop that. And a lot of people got squeamish stomachs and they don't want to hear that word right away. But the best teams love each other. Then we move into the, our unit. Okay, we believe in unit. What are we trying to get done? Well, what we're trying to do is we're trying to develop total trust in the unit we work in. We understand we got a big team here. We might, might not be able to develop total trust within that whole team, but in our units, we can develop total trust. And in fact, we're not gonna do anything special if we can't trust each other totally. We also talk about elite standards. And, and, so, uh, and so how do we behave on these things? So we had a whole curriculum on how to build trust. You can see the behaviors right there. I won't go into the weeds on this right here. When we talk about elite standards, we're talking about relational standards, but I also allow these. This is where it kind of got interesting. Each unit could come up with their own relational standards, aside from crossbreeding, acceptance, caring, et cetera. So this gave them a lot of ownership. They also could come up with a few performance uh, metrics that they really wanted for their unit. We had them as a group, as a team, but they could also have some ownership into some maybe some performance metrics on how they were going to behave there. But this is really a relational document. So we, we honed in hard on how are we going to operate. 
And, and we love to talk about standards, not rules. Standards are us living at our best. Rules kind of are like, we're bottom of the barrel. We're scraping the bottom of the barrel here. So we were always talking about how do we want to operate when we're at our best? What are our standards? And we gave a lot of flexibility to each unit. Lastly, it's about me. It's team unit me. Not less important, but lastly. So what am I going to get out of this? Like what's going to light my fire each day going to, to my team, to this organization? Well, I know when I feel pretty good about things is if I'm improving every day or every week or each month and I'm impacting, I'm having an impact on this team and in my unit. That makes me feel good. Well, that's great. How do I behave? And so we had a curriculum on how to how to improve. And that was grind, refine and compete. I won't go into the weeds there, but that was our way. Impact, again, is owning your 20 square feet. You got to make it better. You got to leave it better than you found it. Hopefully every day, certainly every week. But when your time is is ended on on this team or organization, you can walk away with your hel head held high saying, this, this play, my 20 square feet is way better than when I found it. Okay. So let's segue into how we create this, this document. Okay. First and foremost, it's going to take a lot of inner work. You need to start that process right now. If you're not a project manager or leader of a group right now, you need to start thinking, what are the best teams that I've ever been on before? What are the behaviors that I'm like, I like that. I believe in compassion. I believe in humor. I believe in whatever, equity. I believe in acceptance. Whatever your, what you believe makes the teams or organizations that you've been a part of hum, that's on your heart. Likewise, you got to think about the teams that you didn't like, where you underachieved, like you just, you couldn't wait for the season or the group to dismantle. What, why was that? And so you really got to take some days and weeks to figure this out and put it down what you want your work environment to be like. Once you do that, it's important to collaborate with the rest of the people in your unit. And so I, it's got to come from your heart, but you have to be able to collaborate and get people to be involved so they'll buy in. And when they buy in, then they create that ownership. Now they're part of this. So you know what you want, but you need to open it up. And someone may come up with a better idea than what you were thinking. Yeah, I forgot about that. That is cool. I actually like how they say that better. I think we need that behavior maybe more than this other one I was thinking about. And then lastly, in creating this, it needs to be short, simple and impactful. And what I mean about impactful, it has to ha hit your heart. Like, you know, this is what you're about. It needs to be simple. Like that document I showed you is probably <laughs> it borders on being a little bit too complex. The reason I show you all that is I had these kids for four and five years. And every day I, we lived that document and I would put it in their face somehow, some way. So we got it, I was able to get into the weeds, but if it gets too long, too complicated, they can't memorize it. Our guys knew our, our, our culture is team unit me. Everyone knew what that was and what that looked like, okay? And I will tell you this, another quick story. When I came to UW, I knew how important it was to sit down and put a document this together and get everybody on the same page. But the mistake we made, all the coaches sat down, came up with this. It was beautiful. We loved it. I was so excited to present it to the team and the other units surrounding our program. So we packed our team room with about 200 people in there. And we present this, this document of how we're going to live together, how we're going to operate when it gets hard, what great teams look like. And in hindsight, the way we did that, it didn't work at all. They're looking at, at us like, that's how you want to live and work together. That's not how we want to work together. And so I really skipped the collaboration with our people to get them to buy in and to do this. What I found is when you get them involved, you're really about the same things. There's some fundamentals of team that everybody buys into. They may say them differently and that's okay. Heck, use their words because it gives them more ownership because they're the ones that got to do it every day.
what do I do with this? So now I've created this document. What do I do with it? This document will come to life if you do three things. It's what you preach, how you practice it, and what you permit. And so what I mean by this is another thing that I've learned in my long coaching, you know, 30 plus years of coaching is you get what you emphasize. You get what you emphasize. So how much are you going to talk and emphasize this culture that you put together? You got to get creative. You got to tell stories. You got to pull out examples. You got to bring in articles. You got to show video clips. You got to compete. Every part of your creative bone needs to bring this document to life and preach it day in and day out. Next, you got to practice it. What are we talking about that? You have to model it as the leader. Okay, it starts with you. I show you that document. That's not how a culture is built. That just gives a structure and framework. A culture is built person to person, behavior by behavior, action by action. That's how we do this. And it has to start with the leader modeling it every day. So you're trying to align your thoughts, your beliefs, your words, and your actions. And if you can align those things, it really makes it like you're being authentic in the culture that you want. And that's why that document, it has to come from your heart. And it's really hard for people to be what they can't see. So if you're just going to talk about this and not be about this, you got no chance. It's got to be modeled daily, consistently. And then lastly, um, we'd say this. If you permit it, you promote it. If you permit it, you promote it. There's no such thing as a culturally neutral behavior or belief. There's no such thing. That's like saying you're kind of pregnant. There's no such thing. So if you permit that, and you don't want that, you're saying that's okay. So you're gonna to have to figure out also how to create an accountability system that comes with the culture that you're trying to create. So I'll tell you one little story too. So that's great to put this all together. Now, how, how soon does everybody start buying in and believing and living this? It's gonna take a minute. It's like building muscles. It's building a new skill. You can't put this together and say, hey, we all got this, we're good even if you're preaching, practicing, and promoting every day. It doesn't work like that. It's going to take time. And in fact, I was worried about this. And I got with a couple of leadership culture gurus, and I talked to them, and I said, how long is this going to take for this really to take effect on us? And they said, well, depending on the culture you're coming from and you know what you're inheriting and how far those are off, it'll take age anywhere from maybe 18 to 24 months. And I'm thinking, no way. That's too long. We can accelerate this process. Well, probably 18 to 24 months, I was kind of still looking around going, are we ever going to get this right? Is it going to ever feel like we got it? And so there's a lot of heavy lifting to bring this to light, to life. But it's going to take a minute. It may not take you that long. You might have a tighter unit, you know, uh, you guys are all on the same page, but it's, it's going to take longer than you think. And so here's my takeaways that I'd like to leave you with. Number one, you may not want to do this. You may just want to develop a product, like just go to work. In fact, I know you will, but I really think this is a must. Trust me on learning these hard lessons. Every time I let this thing slide, it comes back to get me. Or we underachieve, we're frustrated with each other. It just doesn't go how it's supposed to. Next, you got to create the buy-in. Even though this document has to be coming from your heart, you've got to get your people on board so they can own it as well. And then lastly, you're not the CEO, you're the CCO. You are the chief cultural officer, and that is a 24-7, 365 job. It's all the time, full time, or it's not going to happen. And so we end up back where we started, you know, and this is what we were all about, you know, this culture of excellence. 
where we were trying to do these common things in an uncommon way. And the number one common thing that we were trying to do uncommonly was be all about team unit me. I thank you for your time and I look forward to your questions. All right, thank you so much. Powerful words, Chris Peterson, thank you so much. And uh, it's great to see in chat that people are already resonating uh, with what you said. I will ask a question. If you, I noticed on your cultural playbook that uh, winning or scoring points wasn't a part of either the team or the unit. Uh, while we're waiting for questions, can you explain whether that was missing on, on purpose or just by the, on the example or by accident there? Again, this document was, you know, really set up for it's about how we're going to work together. And the second thing is the one thing that we never had to talk about was winning or losing. Like they got that since they've been four years old. And when, you know, the four year olds that play the first basketball game where the parents don't let them have a scoreboard, the kids know who won and lost. Like they always know scoreboard. So that was, that's irrelevant. Like that's just, the scoreboard is a product of the environment we create and the product that we put out there. So we hardly ever talked about that. That never came up. All right, so we've got a lot of good questions. We're gonna to get to as many of them as we can before we send people to breakouts for networking and talking about what you took away from this. But Chris, uh, product managers, some of them have little formal authority. Uh, you know, Oftentimes they need to engage with different stakeholders from different organizations and, and hope that they will align together. Um, can you talk about how you could persuade others when you don't get to be the one building this document? So let me say this. We want to segue a little bit into leadership here. Leadership to me is not a position. It is a service given. Like that is the mindset. And the best coaches that I know, the highest level coaches, let's just move to the NBA. To me, I have so much respect for those NBA coaches that have been doing it for a long time because the coaches, the NBA coaches, they don't have the power. The players have the power. So the best coaches win influence. They are all about winning influence. And so that's what real leadership does is they win influence with their people and then they can get things done. And this is a question from Andrew Maxwell LaChapelle. Uh, so you might, how do you change a failed culture that's still finding success? So they're somehow winning, but it's maybe a toxic environment or it's me first, or you're not getting the culture you wanted. How do you change it when you don't say, get to say, hey, we're not doing what we wanted to do. Uh, that's a great question. Um, and I think we've been part of that. I've been part of teams. I, I, I will tell you this. I talked to a coach that was on a national championship team not too long ago. They win the national championship. He said within 15, 20 minutes of being done with the celebration on the field, they go into the locker room. 20 minutes later, everybody's gone, scattered. And you're thinking, what? Who wants to live like that? This is our lives we're talking about. So can you produce some things the hard way that doesn't feel right, that we're maybe not working at our highest level? Yeah, you can. But when you think about like every minute of my life that's so precious, I'm spending here and I, I want to create fulfillment and joy and really like this, that's what it's all about. Like they're going to look back and go, that was great. That's going to wear off. And yeah, we won a national champ, big deal. What you remember is the feelings you had. And if those feelings aren't good, what are we doing here? And this question is from Kelsey Ramirez. Uh, culture, uh, working on the culture takes time and finesse, uh, but outcomes are sometimes more immediate and, and pressing. So how do you uh, balance um, the investment, I guess, when you've got uh, competing timelines. That's awesome. That is good stuff. You, you have to really know, you know, probably through experience. And I think if you search your heart again on some of the good teams you're all about and that you weren't, you're going to have to take time to emphasize and coach and teach this. And you got to get to create the buy in, right? It doesn't have to be. Um, it's not the majority of your time. It can be a small piece out of your day. It can be a five minute thing. It could be a 10 minute thing. It can be a 30 second thing if you're really creative. 
but it needs to be done. And you need to create this really cool environment, really for two reasons that just got brought up, that we that we like each other, that we, we enjoy doing this together. You know, we can't just be a bunch of mercenaries that at the end of the day, it's just about putting this out and I'm off to the next thing. That that's going to wear that that feeling is going to like catch everybody in the long run. And you're going to say, what am I doing with my life? And this question's from Ryan Van Drunen. Uh, could you speak more to accountability? So how do you kind of course correct if, if there's a, a toxic culture that's creeping in? Um, talk about how you use accountability and, and what's the right level of accountability to help kind of right the ship. Well, I think that starts with that extreme ownership, right? I mean, one of, one of the tenets of our whole, Jeff mentioned built for life, one of the things we were trying to do with our, our players. And the, one of the number one things is extreme owner, taking extreme ownership of your life and situation. We would tell guys from our first meeting, you want to change your life today? Do these three things. Don't, don't blame anybody. Don't complain about things. And don't make excuses. You know how hard that is? I struggle with that daily. But if you can say, hey, it is what it is. I just need to fix this. Like that's what I've learned in my time of being a head coach. So many things happen that necessarily aren't my fault but they're my responsibility to get fixed and get right. And so I need to own that. And so I would take extreme ownership with everything. It's like, it doesn't matter who created the problem. We just need to fix it. So this message needs to be ingrained into our DNA of taking ownership of everything that we're all about. You can't and grow. I'll just say this, Jeff, I'm sorry. Like a victim mindset, you have no chance to progress and grow if you have a victim mindset. So that has to go out the door. If we're going to be on this continually learning and, you know, everybody talks, that's the buzzword about growth mindset. Like you, you can't grow if you're a victim. You just can't. And so this is an interesting question. Uh, now I'm going to add some extra details to it. So you had a lot of pro quality players. And so there's always the risk that when you're that talented, you come there to put in the work, but just to go pro and it's harder to buy into this uh, team unit me. And so this question from Jake uh, Schnackenberg is, how do you build the culture and how do you manage this teams when the workforce is more like mercenaries? So they might be either contract work or very similarly, they might be looking for the bigger prize, getting uh, leveling up to another company. And so you don't, don't have like a full time with them. So from your experience, how do you do this when the workforce is more like mercenaries? So that's what that talk's all about that I just gave, right? I mean, it's no different for us. We have superstars. We have the best of the best, you know, so to speak, in terms of college football players coming our way. They want, they all want to go to the NFL. We're all about trying to help them get there. Like we tell them that we're trying to develop skill. We want to highlight your strengths and talents. And we're, you know, we want to help you chase your dream. And the best way to do this is to let us all help you do this, is to be part of this team. And there's enough, like it's not a zero sum game. Like there's enough to, for all of us to share in the glory when it's going right. But when it's not going right and we wanna operate on a selfish, that it's all about me, that never works out better ever than if we all are gonna do this together. So that's what I'm talking about. It's a 365 job. Of, you know, of changing the DNA and the paradigm of thinking. We want, you want the best tech workers you can find. You want the best thinkers you can get. You know, there's a big difference between a big ego and a strong ego. A big ego is arrogant. It's about me, me first. A strong ego is confident and it's about us together doing great work. How do you navigate um, the difference between collaboration and consensus? Um, so I'll leave it at that unless you want me to try to embellish, but I think that's, that's what's written there. Collaboration versus and consensus, how do you navigate that? Yeah, um, you know, the collaboration thing, every time I skip that and I think I got all the answers, it just comes back to like hurt me so bad because when we truly collaborate, I learn. And the things that I was thinking about, a lot of it, 
I don't get away from like my thinking was like, this is what I still really think is important, but I get other things from people that go, wow, this is a little bit better. And if you don't collaborate and you're just telling people what to do, there's a huge difference between commitment and compliance. And as a leader, you're trying to get this commitment to your unit, to your program. You can tell people what to do. And, you know, if you're in that, if you have more formal authority over them, they'll, they'll compliant, they'll, they'll do it, but not with all their heart. They won't innovate. They're just going to do what you said to do. So at the end of the day, you're going to have to make that decision what it's all about. But it's really important to truly listen and hear and maybe figure out a better way. Because I promise you, if you do that, you're going to take some other people's ideas other than your own. And then uh, one of the things you said was trust. And so we have a question about when you mess up uh, or some, a decision you made with the best information and it didn't go the way you thought it did or others thought it would, how do you maintain or regain trust when um, things go wrong, I guess? You know, I, I can't tell you, actually, I can tell you, but my players and coaches could probably tell you more how many times I would mess up on it, how many times I'd be wrong on a daily basis. And I always thought of three things, you know, there's three values that I, there's a ton of them, but three that really jumped out to me about being a leader. And I was always trying to earn their respect in the moment when hard things would come my way. Like I wanted to really earn their admiration, how I handle things. The second thing is, is I wanted to build trust. We talked about those, you know, I show, you, you saw the three things about um, connection, um, competency, and character. And so that's a whole other thing, but I really want to build trust with them. And then the third thing is I think humility. Like when you're wrong as the leader, you need to fess up. Everybody knows it. So be a, be a normal human. That's what they want to see anyways. And just say, wow, I blew that one. And it just works better. They're, they get the transparency and the authenticity and it, and it just, it works. And you're going to be wrong a lot. And you just need to own it, fix it, and move forward. All right. So uh, Jared wants you to put your name in the hat for Pac-12 commissioner. And <laughs> um, we have a question uh, that a couple people keep asking this. Who who do you admire? So who's been a good role model for you as a leader or and or what book would you recommend? What what book has, has touched you in some way? But role model or books that helped shape you as, as the leader that you've become? You know, my, my thing is, Jeff, is I, I've just been I just really one of the things I've just probably done. I've done so many things wrong, but the one thing that I've always paid attention to is I've always paid attention to the people that have been in my path that I really admired. So it started with my college coaches that I was just so blessed to have coaches that thought differently than most. I mean, this was 30 plus years ago. They were so ahead of the game in terms of how they treated kids and what they were all about. And then along my journey, I just would always admire people, how they I'd always talk about performing the storm. You know, when things get hard, how do they react and behave? And most of the time I would look at people and say, I don't want to be like that. I don't want to be like that. That is impressive. And try to, you know, get that into my heart and what was impressive about it. So I'm just always paying attention. I'm, I'm learning to this day. I don't have all the answers. These, I'm just sharing some stuff that I've learned with you along my journey. But the reason it's still exciting to me because there's so much still for me to figure out. And how to keep, how to minimize my my mistakes that I make so often. I read all the time. There's been my my office here is like a library. I've kind of gotten away from books um, because I've read so many and they take so long that I like articles. You know, I can kind of cover that quicker. But I mean, I I got some of my favorites back here in terms of, um, you know, good to great and. I love the slide edge and there's coaching books and there's the powerful engagement. I mean, we could go on and on. Um, I got a whole favorites over here as well. And, you know, the leadership challenge and managing yourself and the Harvard business review with all their, it's an ongoing, you know, journey. All right. Thank you. Uh, Chris Peterson, legendary coach, two-time Paul Bear, Bryant <laughs> award winner, uh, 
two-time yeah, undefeated coach and generally nice guy taking us all on a journey to learn about how to do better at leading teams and, and becoming the leaders that we uh, can be. So uh, show your hands there for Chris Peterson. Uh, thank you all for the great questions. Thank you for coming. Foster the Product is not just an event series, it's a community. It's not just a community for the University of Washington or the University of Washington's Foster School of Business. It's a community for everyone. We uh, are trying to really help everyone level up and we're trying to level up together where uh, it's a place to learn, it's a place to connect, and it's a place to grow. And so please invite uh, your colleagues, invite your friends, uh, help make this uh, community inclusive so that everybody has access to some of the knowledge that could help them uh, develop successful products and develop their careers. Jackie Bavaro is on February 18th. Um, Vishal Gutka, Chief Product Officer at Payscale is March 4th. And then the Head of Relevance at Facebook AI, Iman Barhome, is on April 1st, 2021. And then also on May 7th, I'm super excited about this, we are having an inclusive product management summit. So we're going to help you learn how to build more inclusive products and manage more inclusive teams. We've got uh, amazing speakers from Amazon, T-Mobile, VMware, uh, faculty from the Information School, the College of Engineering, uh, the Foster School of Business, and it's going to be a great chance to really learn uh, how to build a more inclusive team, uh, how to build more inclusive products, and it'll be a place to meet other people who are passionate about the, those efforts, uh, which is a really valuable experience. So that's May 7th. Mark your calendar and check back for uh, news on that. And please also uh, join our LinkedIn group, our Foster the Product LinkedIn group. Uh, let's grow this community. Let's support each other along the way. And let's help everybody have access to this wonderful career in product management. Or let's utilize the skills from product management to help everybody uh, have fruitful careers uh, pushing products forward and pushing society forward in a meaningful way.